Welcome everyone to The Spoken Nerd, the podcast about database technology. I'm your host, Connor McDonald, and welcome back after what I must admit is somewhat of a long break from the podcast. In my defense, we had the Easter break, and that's followed here in Australia by the school holidays. And rest assured, trying to get some time to have a quiet moment in the house with children running in the background is not the easiest thing. I figured you wouldn't want to hear a podcast where all you can hear in the background is the sounds of yelling along the lines of, he hit me, it's my turn on the Xbox, take your brother out of the microwave, etc, etc. I even tried sitting in my wardrobe or closet, which I must admit was quiet enough to record a podcast. But as I sat there, surrounded by coats and jackets and trousers, I thought, is this really what I want to be doing with my life? So I waited until the children had gone back to school, and now finally I have a chance to get on with the podcast and hopefully keep you interested in the Oracle technology. Today's episode continues on with the back to basics philosophy, and that is we're going to talk about the read consistent model in the Oracle database today. Alternate terminologies you may hear out there in the interwebs are things like MVCC, multi-version concurrency control, or the readers and writers model. Before talking about why I consider the consistency model in Oracle to be basically magic, I think to set the scene, I want to go back to my first programming years when databases first started coming onto the IT landscape. For me, that was IBM's DB2 on a mainframe. I started off as a COBOL programmer. And as PCs started to work their way into the modern IT landscape, we started to see things like DBase. Do you remember DBase 3, Paradox, FoxPro? smaller versions of what we now consider to be the modern databases such as Oracle, SQL Server, Postgres, etc. But when you consider all of these database products, all of them had one thing in common, and that is, well, they cost money. You had to buy these things. They weren't free. And at the time, with my naive COBOL mindset, I was of the opinion of, why? How complicated can a database be? After all, it's just reading data on a file. Given that I came from the mainframe days and had pretty much written COBOL for most of my life, that's all COBOL did. You used some JCL or job control language to list the files you were going to be accessing in your COBOL program. You ran your program. It got scheduled by the scheduler. It read the file and out came the results. So in my mind, I was of the opinion that how can databases be so much different? What's all the fuss about? Yes, indeed, there was this new cool language called SQL, which seemed to make the access very, very easy and easier to understand for the non-IT folk out there. But in reality, I was like, well, ultimately, it's still just reading a file. What's the big deal? Of course, my younger self hadn't put two and two together by that stage. And of course, with a COBOL program, in fact, many mainframe programs that ran in batch mode, you had exclusive access to those files. The magic of databases, the thing that really makes them different to any other simple file access that you'll get in any computing paradigm, is a database is happy to support multiple people reading and multiple people writing those files or those databases at the same time. Anyone can do that without a database, but doing it in a way that doesn't result in a disaster, i.e. you're getting wrong results from the data, or the database crashing with a file locking or corruption error is perhaps where the real talent of databases lies. Don't get me wrong, databases didn't just spring out of nowhere and have all these facilities from day one. I remember in simplest forms when I was using those PC-based databases like DBase3 and Paradox and the like, they had a very simple mechanism to ensure that the data didn't get corrupted. You could have an unlimited number of readers of the data, but only a single writer at any given point in time. Given the speed of networks in those days, this was hardly an issue because very few people use these databases concurrently anyway. Then as databases began to take over the world and evolved, we started to see more flexible solutions coming from the big players, namely DB2, SQL Server, Sybase, Infomix, Oracle, etc. Many of these early versions of the databases fell into a almost flexible category, I suppose, for lack of a better term. If you were reading data, then no one else could change it at the same time. Or obviously, if you were writing data, then no one would be reading it. 
This seems an unusual restriction, but in reality, if you were doing these operations quite quickly, then by the time you'd finished reading the data, someone who was blocked from writing it would only be waiting a few milliseconds before they would then be eligible to get access to the data. You need to remember that in these times, which is probably around the sort of early 90s, then the vast majority of systems being built on databases were transactional systems. They hadn't really fallen into the category yet of big data and data warehousing, etc. That was to come later. Then the vendor that really turned all of this on its head was Oracle. Of course, you can accuse me of bias, but I'm pretty sure that it was Oracle that had the very first implementation of what we now know as the readers do not block writers and writers do not block readers. I think it was Oracle version 4 that was the first to offer that facility, and it was over a decade before others started to offer similar facilities. So in this episode today, we're going to talk about how Oracle does it. Many of the other database vendors also offer the same facilities, but they do it typically by different methods. Of course, I don't want to turn this into a database vendor bashing session, so I'll just say one sentence on the different mechanisms that are being used, and that is Oracle's is the best. <laughs> Seriously though, what is important is that whatever database vendor technology you are using and the mechanisms via which they implement flexible reading and writing of data concurrently, it is important to understand at least some of the fundamentals of how they implement that so that you are best equipped to make sure you understand the pros and cons and possible implications of the way that it's implemented. I'm not saying you have to dive so deep that you're into block dumps and stuff like that, but having a cursory knowledge of how it works means you'll be best equipped to write successful applications to take advantage of it and not fall into the traps that all of these implementations will ultimately have. So let's take a look at how Oracle implements multi-version concurrency control, or readers don't block writers, writers don't block readers. To understand that, we need to go back to the simplest mechanisms that databases offer, but perhaps one of the things that probably transformed databases to make them so popular, and that is the ability to conduct transactions. For a dinosaur such as myself, that too was a awesome revelation compared to the days of writing files with COBOL, where you had one shot at it. The ability to do some changes and then say, whoops, is basically a programmer's dream the ability to undo mistakes that you made. Let's face it, when you do an update or a delete in a database and then you can just type in rollback, you certainly gain that feeling of invincibility as a developer, that the database has got your back, so to speak. It's not going to let you make a career-limiting move. The natural question that comes from that is, how does the database let us do that? How does it protect us from ourselves, so to speak? Or more accurately, the programs that we write. In simple terms, the database remembers stuff. I know that seems a very off-the-cuff statement, but in reality, that's all it has to do. In Oracle, we use what is known as an undo segment. And as the name suggests, it is an area of the database used to store information in order to undo an operation that has just been performed. Let's assume you've updated a row in the employee table. For example, your own row to add 20% to your salary. That would be nice, although the auditors would probably be jumping in there as well. A database needs to be able to undo that change should you come along and type rollback. Even before we tackle that from a technical perspective, we can think about two ways the database could approach that operation. The first one is when someone says, I want to make a change to a row, that we could perhaps not do that change. We would simply build up a list of pending changes that the database wants to do, and then when the operator finally enters the commit or the program runs a commit, then we would go ahead and actually apply those pending changes. That's one way of doing it. Another way would be the opposite, to go ahead and do the change. And then if someone wants to roll it back, then we do more work to go undo it. When you think about what most databases are going to do for most of their lives, I would say that 99% of transactions are going to be committing. So from a database perspective, it would make sense to always go ahead and do a change whenever someone requests it and only do extra work if they need to be able to undo or roll that change back. And that's exactly what the database does. When you make a change to a row, we don't store it in a pending area. We don't build up a list of operations that need to be applied at commit time. We just go ahead and do it on the assumption that most of the time 
you're going to want to commit that change. You will have noticed that no matter how many changes you do in an Oracle database, when you type in the word commit, it pretty much just comes straight away and says, yep, we're done. Doesn't matter if you've changed a million rows, still the commit is almost instantaneous. But for those 1% of the times where you do want to roll back that change, we need to be able to do it for you and always be able to do it for you. And to handle that, we store information on how to undo that change. So from an external perspective, you're just running an SQL. You're saying update my employee table for my particular row and add 20% to my salary. Internally, the database is doing things in a much more machine-like operation. Your SQL ultimately becomes something like find block number 375 in file number 17, go to the fourth row in that block, which happens to be my employee row, go to the ninth column, that be the salary row, and change that from $1,000 to $1,200. Because we need to be able to undo that change in the rare case that you're going to enter in rollback, then we record the equivalent reversal information in the undo area. My update, which was block 375, file 17, fourth row, change the ninth column. In the undo area, I store something along the lines of, hey, if I need to abandon this change, go to block 375 in file 17, go to the fourth row in the block, go to the ninth column, and change the salary from 1200 to 1000. In that sense, you can consider a database is always changing things in a forward motion of time. It just so happens that those changes when you do a rollback are reversal changes to actually undo the initial changes you were done. Thus, when you hit rollback, we navigate our way to the undo area and start applying those instructions. If you're a regular podcast listener of mine, you'll know that when I did the block internals session, we spoke about the fact that the undo block address is stored on data blocks themselves. So on a given data block, we can actually see where the undo information for a transaction on that block is stored. That's one mechanism of how we can navigate to the undo to ensure that we can roll back a transaction. Rolling back a transaction is all well and good, but how does this relate to read consistency and the multi-version concurrency control model? Way back in Oracle 4, some very smart person inside Oracle decided, you know, there might be an opportunity here for us to take advantage of that undo information for purposes other than just rolling back transactions. You can imagine that with a database that uses undo information to roll back a transaction, that once you commit, we could throw that undo information away. After all, the transaction is now permanent. If we were doing that inside the Oracle database, that would take resources. You do a commit, and now we have to go find that undo information and throw it away. An optimization could be to simply leave it hanging around and replan that space as required. In that way, your commits are nice and fast and the freeing up of undo information gets deferred as long as possible. I don't know for sure, but I would imagine that philosophy is what led to the light bulb moment when it came to building the read consistency model that we know and love in the Oracle database. If that undo information is just floating around there for transactions that have already been committed anyway, then maybe there's an opportunity there. And I'm sure someone inside Oracle one day went, oh my goodness, we could use this stuff for queries. Let me explain where that mindset would have come from with an example. Let's assume I start a query at 9am in the morning and it's going to run for 35 minutes because it's against some massive table. In earlier versions of most databases, that would mean for those 35 minutes, as we passed through the various blocks that comprise that table, we would lock those blocks to make sure no one touches them. In that way, we can guarantee that when we're reading the data, we're going to get a nice consistent view of the data. Once we've moved over some of those blocks, then we would allow other people to come in and do updates. But while we're reading the data, no one's allowed to touch it. There's an obvious problem here. I've now effectively blocked off access to some of my database for a period of up to 30 minutes. Because the alternative would be, as I query that data and someone has potentially changed it, I'm no longer getting a view of the data as it was at 9am. Inside the Oracle database, someone said, why don't we just let people go ahead and change the data anyway? You can imagine that's a fairly brave statement to make, because ultimately the first thing that springs to mind is, we're going to be given 
people wrong results or corrupted data. But the mindset goes like this. At 9am I start my query. Therefore, I've made a guarantee to the person running this query that I'm going to give them their data as it was at 9am. But at the same time, I'm going to let everyone go ahead and change that data as if no one else was on the system. So I've set my query going at 9am. It's off and running. It's going to take about 30 minutes. What happens at 9.10 when someone else comes along and starts making some changes to the rows in the table that I'm running my query on? They might be changing some columns. They might be deleting some rows. They might be adding new rows. Because all of that started after 9am, my initial query is not allowed to see any of those changes. Otherwise, I would get inconsistent results. But as I mentioned earlier, one of the things we do not want to do is build up a list of pending changes when someone makes changes. We want to go ahead and directly change the data because 99% of the time, those changes are going to be committed. It makes no sense to build up a pending list of changes. That would be assuming that most of the time people will roll back rather than commit, which obviously is a nonsense. The consequence of this is that my query that started at 9am is ultimately going to stumble across some blocks that have been changed by other transactions. Those blocks will no longer reflect the state of the database as it was at 9am. They'll now reflect 9.10am, 9.15am. All sorts of changes may have occurred on those blocks that I'm now encountering with my query. It seems we are stuck in a dilemma. But for every transaction that occurred on the database, remember that we had to store some undo information in order to roll back that transaction. Even though that transaction has been committed, we are hanging on to the undo until we have to reclaim that space. So what my query can do, the one that started at 9am, it can take on the role of someone who wants to roll back a transaction. It will ultimately hit, for example, a block that was changed at 9.10am and it will say, hmm, a transaction occurred on this block after the moment in time that I started my query. That's okay. What I can do is I can grab that block I'll take a temporary copy of it in memory because I don't want to change the real block on disk. And now I can go find the undo information for some other session's transaction. Whatever other session changed that data must have recorded some undo. I can look in this block I've taken a copy of, find the undo block address, the pointer to where the undo information is stored. I'll go off, find the undo information, and I'll undo the transaction that changed that block. That will take the block that was changed at 9.10 a.m. It might change it back to, say, 9.05 a.m. That's still after 9 a.m. and therefore it's no good to me. I can't use that because there is still an outstanding change. But that's okay because that block I've taken back from 9.10 a.m. to 9.05 a.m. will also have a pointer to the undo for its transactions. So I'll then go to a different place in my undo area, get the undo information for the transaction that occurred at 9.05 a.m., and then I'll undo that. That might take that block back to 8.45 a.m. For my query that started at 9 a.m., any block that's older than 9 a.m., in this case 8.45 a.m., is perfect for me. That's a valid block that I can read to give a consistent set of results for my query that started at 9 a.m. In effect, every block in the database has the equivalent of what you could call a timestamp, the last time this block was changed. Every time I run a query, I take note of when my query started, and then every block I encounter throughout the duration of my query, I check that timestamp. Is the timestamp before when my query started? Then I'm good to use that block. Is the timestamp after when my query started? This block is no good to me. I'll take a copy of it in memory and start finding transactions that modify this block. I'll then find the undo for those transactions, and I'll take this block backwards in time, so to speak. I may have to take it backwards in time many, many times in order to get it back before the time at which my query started. But all of that information is stored in the undo area for my database, and I just simply keep rolling back transactions that other sessions have done, or even my own session for that matter, until I get a view which is before the point in time at which my query commenced. Now, before you race out and start dumping blocks or looking in the manuals for this mystical timestamp that sits on every single block, I'm being a bit loose here with the truth. Let's face it, none of us as developers like dealing with timestamps because some people have different time zones, some people have summertime and springtime. Dealing with timestamps has always been a pain for anyone in the IT industry. 
think about a technique that we as developers often use when we want to record information and have a rough idea of the order in which things have occurred. We might assign a unique sequence number to every transaction in our database tables. Inside Oracle, we do the same thing. Rather than have a timestamp on every single block, we have a thing called the system change number, a number that simply grows with every single transaction that goes on inside your database. If you go back to my block dumping podcast session, you'll see we talk about the fact that whenever you do a block dump, you'll often see the term SCN floating around as an acronym. It stands for system change number. Inside the database, we also have some functions that let you do basic conversion from an SCN to a timestamp. There's timestamp to SCN and SCN to timestamp functions. So in reality, the SCN is a reasonable measure of the timestamp at which a block has changed. And it's the SCN number that we use to compare blocks when it comes to read consistency. So briefly revisiting my query, when I say a query starts at 9 a.m., internally it means the database says, I have started my query at SCN number 12345. As I encounter each block, as long as the SCN on that block is lower than that starting number, then I'm good to use that block. If the SCN is higher than that number, then I need to go hunting for transactions in the undo area in order to undo those changes to get back to lower than that starting SCN threshold. Savvy listeners are probably starting to see a potential issue here. If every time I run a query, I need to be able to find the transactions that have occurred since that query started and potentially find the undo for them and undo those changes. What happens if I have a query that runs for say, five days? Now, don't get me wrong, normally any query that runs for that length of time, I would have some concerns about. It's probably a recipe for some much needed tuning or my application schema might need some much needed design fixes. But let's be honest, We've all had those systems where some queries run for way longer than we want them to. If my query started five days ago, well, that means I could stumble upon two transactions that have occurred any time between now all the way back to five days ago, and I would need to be able to undo them. That means the undo area would need to contain five days worth of transaction changes floating around just ready for me to use to undo my query. As we all know, disk space is not unlimited. It's relatively cheap, but it's not unlimited. And ultimately, the amount of undo information in your database will be recycled over time. You can nominate an upper limit as to how much undo information you're prepared to keep. And after that, the database will start to reclaim that undo information to reuse it for newer transactions. That raises a bit of a problem. If my query that has been running for several days stumbles upon a block that was changed say three days ago, I'll see the undo pointer there saying, yep, this is how I undo the transactions. I'll reach out to the undo area and it will say, I'm sorry, we no longer have the undo information for that transaction. That space has been reclaimed for newer transactions. Now my query is a bit stuck. It's hit upon a block that is too new to be used for its query because this query has been running for days, but I have no mechanism via which to undo the transactions on it. This is the source of the famous Aura 1 triple five error, snapshot too old. Of course, it's not really a snapshot and we're not really talking about age, so I would consider it a poor piece of error message text, but we can understand what's going on here. Your query started a long time ago. It's trying to find some information in the undo area which no longer exists, therefore we can't guarantee you a consistent view of the data. Aura 1 triple five sounds cataclysmic when it happens to you, but in reality, often the simple solution is just to rerun your query. Why is that a solution? Because the moment you restart your query, you've now picked up a much more recent timestamp. You're starting your query right now. Therefore, you're much more likely to pick up undo information that is more recent. Don't get me wrong. If that query is once again going to run for five days, then you would need to have five days worth of undo information floating around in your system in order to guarantee that query finishing. Armed with this knowledge, you can make some intelligent decisions about how to best manage your applications and your database. If I have massively long running queries, 
then your DBA probably needs to make sure the undo information area is large enough to store undo information that will span the longest duration of any query. By the same token as developers, you want to make sure your queries run as fast as possible. Obviously, that helps your customers as well, but also it makes a decision as to when you might run your longest running queries. If you can run your queries when database activity is quiet, it means the likelihood of you encountering blocks that need to have a lot of transaction undo applied is lower. Therefore, the likelihood of getting an Aura 1555 is lower, and also the actual performance of your queries will be faster as well. Undoing transactions is a resource cost. It's not unusual to find people surprised to see that a query that normally runs very quickly suddenly runs a little bit slower than expected because it is busily undoing a whole lot of transactions. If you're familiar with the Oracle system statistics, you can see session and system level stats looking for terms such as undo records applied in the various statistic names, which shows you some information about how often we've had to go and undo information in order to give people a consistent view of the data. If those numbers are extremely high in particular sessions, that's an indication that queries in that sessions had to do a lot of work just to get a consistent view of the data. And perhaps it would be better running them at a different time of day if possible. Understanding how the database gives you a consistent view of the data is also critical not just for performance reasons, but in terms of application correctness. For example, let's say my employees table has a upper limit of 10 rows for each department. That sounds like a trivial requirement to build as an application developer. Before I go to insert a new row, I find the department number that's about to be used. I do a select count star from my employee table. If the row count is more than 10 already or equals 10, then I block the insert. That sounds trivial, but because of the way Oracle implements its read consistency, that would fail. Consider a department which currently has nine employees in it. One session will start to do its insert for that department and do a query saying how many rows are in there? Ah, oh, there's only nine. Another session will do the exact same logic. It will say how many rows are in there? There's currently nine. Both those sessions will quite happily say, yep, there's nine rows in there. I can safely put another one in. They'll both insert, both commit, and all of a sudden we have 11 rows in our table for the particular department. This is because each session does not see another session's uncommitted transactions. That is the beauty, but also risk of having this consistency view model inside the Oracle database. We never want to see someone else's changes, but because of that, you need to take care when building applications along these lines. These kind of logic errors can creep in all over the place unless you take a lot of care. For example, let's say I'm copying data from one table to a data warehouse on an hourly basis. Obviously, I don't want to copy the entire table every single time. I probably just want to record all the changes that have occurred since the last time I ran my copy job. Once again, my first thought is, this is easy. I'll simply have a modified date value on the source table, and every hour I'll simply go get everything that last modified date greater than, say, an hour ago, and copy that over to the data warehouse. The problem is, what if there's an uncommitted transaction? Someone has inserted a new row or updated a row on the source table while my copy job is running. I won't see that change, and therefore, that row will not be carried over. However, in an hour's time, when I next go to get that data, because I'm only looking back one hour, I won't see that row which was perhaps 90 minutes ago. I now have a data corruption, even though I'm doing something as simple as copying from one table to another. Such operations require a lot of care and sometimes some judicious use of locking to make sure that we don't miss rows or corrupt rows because we never see someone else's uncommitted transactions. This is one of the biggest reasons why whenever possible in the Oracle database, if you're implementing things that would normally be checked with code, for example, uniqueness or foreign keys, etc., you always try to do them declaratively, for example, with constraints, materialized views, etc. All these things automatically take care of the various concurrency models that are implemented by the Oracle database. If you do it in your own code, then you become responsible for making sure you don't end up with data corruption. So hopefully that gives you some insight into the way that Oracle manages its 
multi-version concurrency control model, or in simpler terms, its read consistency model. The ability to see data as if you're the only person in the database is a fantastic benefit for all developers. It solves so many issues in terms of managing how data is presented back to customers. They'll never get a corrupt view of their data unless your application has bugs. Conversely, it also means understanding this is critical in terms of writing applications that aren't going to make incorrect assumptions about the data that they're seeing. Hopefully you've enjoyed this episode. I'll be back soon with another podcast episode, assuming I can keep my children quiet in the background. You can reach out to me on Twitter if you have any questions or enjoy writing your applications with the Oracle database. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to this podcast. The music credit goes to Zanman from Pixabay Music.